Hello everybody, welcome back to another episode of Decoding the Unknown, the show where we decode the unknown. I, as always, am your host Simon Wams here, one of my writers, in this case Ilza, thank you Ilza, very kind, has written me a script, the true mystery of the pyramids. How were they built? Well, I'll tell you what, it was aliens. <laughs> no, it wasn't, have we talked about this, but haven't we covered this before? I feel like maybe... I don't know. I, I remember making a video a while back, and there's this crazy, there's this wild theory. I think it was on the Today I Found Out channel. There's this theory that they built the pyramids using, like, some old school cement. Like, I think it's not, like, the most popular theory, but it's, like, a genuine theory that's out there that they somehow, like, ground down stones. Is this how cement works? I realize it sounds really dim because I'm like, how do they make rocks from like liquids? <laughs> and obviously it hardens up. But they made some sort of ancient cement and then used blocks to like pour this cement and make the pyramids like that rather than just cutting the stone and then moving it around. And I was like, well, that's super interesting. But I don't know if that's even going to be mentioned today because I don't think it's like the most popular theory. But it was an interesting one and there was all sorts of evidence for it. And I was like, I don't, I don't think I was like fully convinced by the end. But I was quite like, wow. Okay, that's a wild one, isn't it? Anyway, let's just jump in, shall we? Uh, the format of the show, if you're new here, first of all, hello, thank you for being here. Thank you for not clicking off with my rambles. Is uh, I've never read this before. We're going to read and explore it together. <laughs> Egypt, a land of mystery, of enchantment, of sad, oh, so much sad. Also home of the greatest mathematicians to ever exist. I'm referring to the camels, of course. <laughs> okay. And finally, the land of the pyramids. How are camels like excellent mathematicians? What joke am I missing? <laughs> Everyone's going to be a Simon, you're so dim. <laughs> don't you get the joke or the reference? And I'm like, no, I don't. Oh, God. Why do I admit these things? Why don't I just be like a normal person and be like, yeah, the camels with the maths. Hey, I get that. I get the joke. I'm a big brain. <laughs> because let's be honest, while Egypt may have a lot to offer the world, the first thing most people think about when Egypt comes to mind is pyramids. More specifically, the pyramids at Giza. And there's a good reason for this. They're pretty impressive. I have to say, I only recently discovered that the pyramids are quite close to civilization. For some reason in my mind, it, I've never been. I've never been to Egypt. I'd quite like to go. I'd like to see the pyramids. That'd be cool. Why have I never been? I want to go to Egypt. Now I've got kids. It's like you can't just, you know, go away for a week to like check out the pyramids. It's like, is it child appropriate? Is there a good hotel where we can stay? Where they've got appropriate for the kids to do? Do the kids even want to go and see the pyramids? Because if I was a kid, that's not the shit I'd want to do. It's the sort of the parents would drag me to and be like, oh God, it's so hot. <laughs> So much walking, please, no! I don't care! And my dad will be like, this is 5,000 years old. I'll be like, Dad! You know what's not 5,000 years old? The hotel has got air conditioning. Can we please go home? <laughs> Well, I've, I just found out how close to civilization they were. I really thought they were out in the middle of the desert and you'd sort of have to sit on a bus for about six hours to go to see the pyramids. But they're really close to the city. It's like, I saw this picture and I was like, wow, they're really just right there. It's quite cool. I mean, because then you'd have to sit on a bus for six hours to go and see something. <laughs> for many, oh my God, we're five lines in. I'm so sorry. I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. We are going to get to this about how they build the pyramids. I do promise you. This show isn't always like this. I mean, it kind of is, but it also isn't. We do have facts and things to entertain you. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. For many, the civilization of ancient Egypt is synonymous with the pyramid builders. However, there are only 118 pyramids in Egypt. Only? That's a lot of pyramids. I thought there were like six. And while they did build pyramids for around a thousand years, well, that does make them sound kind of lazy, doesn't it? The ancient Egyptian civilization. <laughs> Simon, you're calling all those ancient slaves who built these things lazy. <laughs> it's like, no, sorry. <laughs> And the ancient civilization lasted for over 3,000 years. To put this into some perspective, Cleopatra, the last Egyptian pharaoh, ending 5,000 years of dynastic rule, lived closer to the moon landing than she did to the building of the pyramids at Giza. And I'll tell you what, that's what happens when you put a woman in charge. Am I right? <laughs> I'm not right. It's a joke. It's a joke, please. Don't. Someone will clip that and do it as a short or whatever. I'll be like, oh, for God's sake, it's a joke. Did Cleopatra take a trip out to the desert to gaze in wonder? Although you've got to wonder, she was a woman and she was the la- I have no idea what this history is. I just don't know. I was Cleopatra the one with Mark Antony? And then the Romans came and like killed her? Something like that, or she killed herself? Oh my god, I know I should know this. <laughs> 
Did Cleopatra take a trip out to the desert to gaze in wonder at the grand monuments to her ancestors? Was she as captivated with the pyramids as later generations would be? Or was it just another feature of Egypt, a looming monument as first revered, at first revered but later used as shade by Bedouin merchants and eventually building material? The discovery and subsequent deciphering of the Rosetta Stone in 1822 went a long way to solve some of the mysteries of ancient Europe. Uh, ancient Europe. Sorry, ancient Egypt. But there's still a lot we don't know about the pyramids. One of the greatest mysteries is a fairly simple question. How were these majestic monuments built? The story of the pyramids. A pyramid is not a lone standing massive tomb honoring cat lovers. It forms part of a larger burial complex in ancient Egypt. Pharaohs were considered to become gods after death, so they had tombs befitting future gods, filled with everything a pharaoh would need in the afterlife, depending on the pharaoh in question. And when the complex was built, it might include a palace, temples, and solar boat pits, because every pharaoh worth his salt needed at least one solar boat to join Ra on his sunset cruise. <laughs> It's like you want to make fun of these old religions, but they look at religion today and you're like, <laughs> secretly bizarre, isn't it? I mean, maybe not with the solar boats to join Ra, but there's weird stuff in modern religion, especially the weirder religions. Unfortunately, we don't have a lot of records left to tell us what many of the buildings in the complex and the chambers inside the pyramids themselves were used for, just one of the many, many mysteries of the pyramids. Considering how long it took to build a pyramid, it's believed that a pharaoh would get started on this project as soon as he or she was sitting on that throne. Building a pyramid is quite an undertaking, so the pharaoh would create a team consisting of an observer, the chief engineer, and architect supported by a well-fed workforce to actually build whatever the engineer and architect came up with, much like construction companies today. Since the pharaoh was basically a god on earth, they had access to almost infinite resources in both manpower and building materials, so no dream was too big for the pharaoh. Yeah, and that's why the, 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 big, the big pyramids. What's the big one called? Like the Great Pyramid? The King's Pyramid? Something like that. That was like the biggest building in the world for thousands of years. It's quite crazy. The pyramids at Giza are probably the best known and most impressive of the pyramids, but they weren't the first. Much like the Sistine Chapel wasn't Michelangelo's first painting, the pyramids at Giza weren't the ancient Egyptians' first rodeo. If we look at the older pyramids, we can see how the ancient Egyptians experimented with both the design and construction techniques, and through trial and error, learned what worked and what really didn't. Like many worthwhile pursuits, pyramid building was an evolving art. The Step Pyramid of Saqqara was the first pyramid ever built. Imahotep, Imhotep, Imhotep, or The Mummy, as I know him, created... Oh, is this the person from The Mummy? The bad dude from The Mummy, who's like evil and like mummifies people with scarab beetles. Was that what happened? I remember I watched that movie. We saw, I saw that movie with school. Like, we went on a summer trip, like every year, for like a week. Was it every year? It was something like this. And for some reason, we ended up watching The Mummy in the cinema. <laughs> it's like, great. It's like going to the cinema with school. Okay. Brendan Fraser, looking awesome. Being the, the, the Indiana Jones of my childhood. Uh, so he created the Step Pyramid for King Dejosa during the Third Dynasty by stacking six mastabas on top of each other, getting progressively smaller towards the top. Dejosa sounds like something that should be read without the D, like King Josa. Or like Josa. Josa. I'm just going to go for Dejosa because it sounds cool. And I'm not going to look it up because I don't want to. I feel like I've looked it up before and it was Dejosa or Joe's. Oh, whatever. <laughs> I could look it up. I, I mean, I could. It's just I like reading and I don't want to. It's like when you read, like this is for me, is it's as little like a job as possible. And when you're reading a book at home, you're not looking up the pronunciations, are you? And I don't want to do the same thing. And I know people are like, Simon, the least you could do is make some effort. And I'm like, yes, I could. But some effort sometimes just seems like too much effort, doesn't it? <laughs> Sorry. Sorry. Leave me a bad review if you want. A mastaba is a rectangular burial mound with sloping walls and a flat roof in which earlier kings had been buried. They were mostly made from mud bricks, but some were made of stone. The next step in the evolution of the pyramid was Sneferu's pyramid, also known as the Bent Pyramid, built at Dushur, south of Cairo. This was the second pyramid built for Sneferu after the first of Sneferu sounds like a Pokemon. Sneferu. Sneferu. Evolves into a... Sneferix? How's Pokemon? 
Pokemon. I don't know anything about Pokemon, but it does sound like a Pokemon. After the first attempt at medium was abandoned before completion, the lower part of the Bent Pyramid was built at an angle of 54 to 55 degrees. However, the upper section was built at an angle of 43 degrees, which gives the pyramid its recognizable shape. The Bent Pyramid faces a number of difficulties. Firstly, the site for the Bent Pyramid consisted of loose, sandy soil, which didn't provide a solid foundation for what would become a very heavy building. On top of that, <laughs> don't build your castle on sand. Everybody knows that. On top of that, the earliest pyramids were built with layers of stone sloping inward to form the body of the pyramid. This was already a very unstable design, and along with the less than adequate foundation, the whole thing started sinking. In an attempt to prevent further problems, the architects reduced the slope towards the top, giving the pyramid its very recognizable bent look. However, Sneferu wasn't a pharaoh to give up on his dream of a proper pyramid to loom over his subjects after he passed on to the next realm and commissioned a third pyramid. This third final pyramid, the Red Pyramid, was built a short distance away from the bent one and used what would become the blueprints for future pyramids. It took a while, but they got there in the end. The Red Pyramid, according to some, served as a prototype for the Great Pyramid. Oh, that's it, not the King's Pyramid. The Great Pyramid. As it incorporated some of the valuable lessons that the builders had learned by this point, future pyramids were built on solid rock to ensure proper foundation and support. <laughs> it sounds like... <laughs> guys, guys, come on, obviously. <laughs> what happens to sand? Moves around. What's really heavy? Rock. <laughs> come on, use your big brains. Instead of attempting inward sloping stones, the ancient pyramid builders realized that stacking stones on top of each other horizontally would make for a far more stable construction, so they used large blocks at the bottom to better distribute the load with smaller blocks towards the top. Squares and plums were used to take precise measurements to maintain the right shape. After all, the bent pyramid wasn't exactly the gold standard in pyramid building. The berry, yeah, Sneferi, the Pokemon dude, abandoned it. He was like, yeah, no, first one sucks, second one's rubbish, let's try again. All of the people building it. Oh, for God's sake, Sneferoo. For but how many times? Just enjoy the bent one, Sneferoo. It's perfect. It's unique, Sneferoo. But they wouldn't say that because it'd probably, like, murder them. Or, like, I imagine trap them in a basement with some scarab beetles and ghosts. The burial chamber would be placed inside the pyramid itself instead of, instead of in the ground underneath the pyramid. Corbelled ceilings. No idea what that is. Corbelled. Let's look that up. You can just touch it, and it lets you look it up. Supported on corbels. Oh, that's helpful. <laughs> What's a corbel? Corbel. In architecture, a corbel is a piece of stone. <laughs> Thanks, dictionary. Real helpful right there. Corbelled ceilings were used to create the spacious rooms within the pyramid without sacrificing the structural integrity of the pyramid. Pyramids were also built on natural hills to give a little bit of extra height without extra layers of stone, and finally pyramids would be finished off with fine white limestone. The Great Pyramid of Giza could be considered the pinnacle of pyramid building, and much of what we know about pyramid construction is based on the pyramids at Giza. The Great Pyramid was constructed during the reign of Pharaoh Khufu, around 2550 BCE. It's the largest of the three pyramids towering over the Giza Plateau and stands at around 438 feet. When it was finished, it stood an impressive 478 feet. What happens? It was built using around 2.3 million stone blocks, weighing an average of 2.5 to 15 tons each. No like, what? No way. No, it can't. That's insane. 2.3, I thought it would be like maybe 2,000. I was, a th if someone asked me, how many, how many giant bricks do you think make up the temple? The, uh, the, the, the pyramid, like 1.5 to 2.3 tons. I'll be like, I don't know, 2,000, 3,000, but it's 2.3 million. Good lord. I, I have to look that up. I almost don't believe it. Great pyramid number of stones. 2.3 million. I, I'm sorry for doubting you, Ilza. I just can't believe that number. Good lord almighty. 5.5 million tons of limestone. That's insane! I feel like if you just watched this video and just learned that, this video was worthwhile, wasn't it? Smash that like button! The second pyramid at Giza was built during the reign of Pharaoh Khafre, the son of Khufu, around 2520 BC. His pyramid may have been a little smaller, but he made up for that by including the Sphinx in his necropolis as well. Finally, the third of the pyramids. <laughs> and I told this story before, I thought for the longest time that the Sphinx. You know this Tutankhamun, and he has that, like, really pimp gold mask that he wore, like, on his, like, box or whatever. What's it called? Why can't I remember the word for the box that you buried in? Uh, it's not a tomb. Everyone's screaming this right now. 
Coffin. <laughs> What's going on? Uh, he had this like really cool gold mask on his coffin for the longest time. I don't know why. <laughs> Literally until maybe a few years ago, I thought that was the Sphinx. <laughs> I thought that the that 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 mask was like the size of the Sphinx, and I'm like, wow, no one harvested that gold. That's so much gold. The whole Sphinx is made out of gold, and then it turns out, disappointingly, the Sphinx is just made of boring rock and doesn't even have a nose. And the mask thing is just some small mask that Tutankhamun wore. I also thought Tutankhamun's name was Tutankhamun for the longest time. <laughs> it's not correct. Why do I admit these things? It's just embarrassing. Finally, the third of the pyramids is quite a bit smaller than the first two and was built during the reign of Pharu Menkaure around 2490 BCE. What he lacks in the height of his pyramid, he made up for in the size of his penis. Not really, it doesn't say that. It's just a joke. He made up for in the complexity of the mortuary temple found in his burial complex. Initially, the temple, the pyramids were encased in smooth white limestone and made them... I'm just, I'm just thinking about the pyramid builders, right? There's like all the kings and there's the guy with the giant king pyramid and then there was probably some guy later on and he was like nah just 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 bury me normally and on my inscription on the tomb on my little you know mini size pyramid that's barely taller than myself just right didn't need to compensate for anything did i <laughs> boom and then the archaeologist looks inside and there's some sort of like rasputin's preserved penis in there <laughs> what's wrong with you simon why do you think this way what's wrong with you did anyone else was anyone else thinking that when we talk about the size of their anyone else is it just me <laughs> Are these pharaohs with their tiny willies initially the pyramids were encased in smooth white limestone which made them highly visible because a huge pyramid in the middle of the desert is not visible enough however over the centuries the pyramids have been plundered by grave robbers and the casings were removed to use in other construction projects when the new kingdom period from around 1550 bce to 1070 bce arrived the pharaohs had a change of heart and address and opted to be buried in the valley of the kings located about 300 miles south of giza in so well, that makes sense if they're like, where do you want to be buried where should we bury each other i don't know in the desert or alternatively in the valley of the kings i mean it's even named i know it came later i know it came later it's just a stupid joke like i don't know why located around 300 miles south of giza pyramid building as a hobby declined in popularity and today khufu is still the man with the biggest burial tomb ever and also the small he also it also didn't do him any good however as while well, we found this tomb his actual remains are never were never found i guess size doesn't necessarily mean security who built i don't know if that's a penis joke Maybe it is. Maybe it is also. <laughs> Not appropriate. Who built the pyramids? When we look at how the pyramids were built, an important question to ask is who built the pyramids? There are a lot of wonderful theories involving aliens in Atlantis. Yeah, but look, if you look at the Great Pyramid from a distance, looks really cool. But if you look at it up close, all the rocks are like higgledy piggledy and a bit sh. And it's like, well, if aliens are going to build it, assuming they flew like all the way across the universe, they're going to at least line up the rocks properly. They're not going to just be like, yeah, we'll be higgledy piggledy. We did higgledy-piggledy with our spaceship, and it works out great. One thing spaceships are not is higgledy-piggledy. Although that International Space Station is quite higgledy-piggledy. Why do I keep saying higgledy-piggledy? I don't know. That's a good question. I don't know. Um, it's like because they just fly up all bits and attach it on there. So actually, maybe spacecrafts are higgledy-piggledy. I worry now that higgledy-piggledy is a British term, and all the Americans listening, which is the majority of you, hello America, uh, you're thinking, what the f*** is he talking about? What is higgledy-piggledy? <laughs> it means, like, messy, like, all kind of jammed together. There are a lot of wonderful theories involving aliens in Atlantis, but I'm sure aliens have far more important things to do than build pyramids in a desert, and Atlantis only ever lived in the imagination of Plato. The people responsible for the marvels of ancient Egypt were the people who lived there, the ancient Egyptians. It's shocking, we know. A popular notion is that the pyramids were built by slaves, however, the discovery of the lost city of the pyramid builders by Egyptologist Mark Lenner proves otherwise. The city was found close to Menkore's pyramid, the last to be built on Giza's plateau. Lenner and his team made quite a few other important discoveries, such as the oldest bakery ever found in Egypt, containing a cache of bread pots and an ancient chamber which turned out to be the oldest pillared hall ever discovered in Egypt, filled with low benches. Being an archaeologist like this got me cool. Like, a mate of mine's an archaeologist, and I get the feeling in a lot of his life, it's like, it's still cool, but he spends a lot of his time, like, very carefully documenting stuff, and then spending time inside buildings in labs and stuff, and less, like, breaking into old bakeries and, like, finding these things. But it's still pretty cool, right? That's a cool job. 
It could have been a dining hall, but we don't really know. The team also uncovered 170 meters, that's around 550 feet long blocks of modern looking non-domestic galleries, most likely used as barrack housing for the permanent labor force consisting of around 1,600 to 2,000 workers. A building containing hundreds of seals dating back to the time of Kafa and Menkure, probably used by officials to keep track of the sizable operation of feeding and housing the workers, proved that bureaucracy was alive and well in Egypt, and another building, a storehouse, contained circular bins, most likely used to store grain. On top of all that, the remains of animal bones show that the inhabitants feasted on sheep and goat and even beef, the best meat available in ancient Egypt. And honestly, the best meat available today. God, maybe I'm gonna have, I think I'm gonna have steak for dinner tonight. Yeah, I'm gonna have a delicious steak. <laughs> Done. Decision made. Yum. <laughs> Tombs discovered at the foot of the pyramids indicate that the workers were buried in, play, in a place of honor and the bodies showed healed fractures, which means access to solid healthcare. Slaves, these people were not. The workforce most likely consisted of a core group of highly skilled and specialized builders and craftsmen that were employed on a permanent basis. This smaller group would have spent the year cutting stones and doing the survey and preparation work. This group of specialists was then supported by a rotating labor force, most likely agricultural workers who would spend around three months of the year working on the pyramids when things on the farm slowed down for the season. The labor force might have included as many as 25,000 men and they would have been the ones hauling the stone from the quarries and putting them into place on actual pyramids themselves. The permanent workforce most likely lived in the pyramid builders town while the seasonal workforce probably lived in the temporary camp closer to the site the workmen hauling setting and casing the stones were divided into gangs and each gang probably consisted of around 200 people graffiti uncovered in the early 20th century shows that the gangs even had names such as friends of khufu and the drunkards of menkore that definitely been it's like what's your group called friends of the king what's your group called drunkards of the area i'll be like i'm with you you friends <laughs> where beeth the pub Apparently, the workers under Menkore had a bit more fun. Yes, they did. How were they actually built? How do you go about building a pyramid? First off, you need a rectangular base. Wait, aren't they square? Oh, I guess a square is a type of rectangle, right? Or is a rectangular type of square? What way round does that go? <laughs> I'm going to assume it's the first way because pyramids are square, right? When laying out this base, it's vital to take correct measurements to make sure your pyramid is going to look like a pyramid, and of course, make sure that it's not going to fall down. Ancient Egyptians didn't have access to the, all the amazing tools that we have today. No, they, they're better, they're the aliens! But if there's one thing we can say for our ancestors, it's that they didn't lack in the Department of Creativity and Ingenuity. To keep things as accurate as possible, the Egyptians developed and used the cubit measuring rod, which looks like a ruler marked with hieroglyphs to measure the dimensions and layout of the pyramids, as well as the square level, basically a triangle with a plumb bob attached to level horizontal surfaces. That's the sort of, that's a genius invention, whoever came up with that. It's really clever. And it's like, you know, thinking about, you'd imagine if you go back in time like thousands of years and all the inventions that you, you could come up with, people would be like, yeah, we don't have the wheel. And you'd just be like, okay, cool, what are you doing? <laughs> Make this big circle thing, punch a hole in the middle, put a stick through it, boom! And people would be like, holy sh how did we not think of this? But I'd also be like, if I was back there, I'm sure I wouldn't invent any of this sh <laughs> Too stupid. Some also suggest that they used water-filled trenches to make sure that the perimeter was perfectly level. Once you have this base, you start adding layers, with each layer being smaller than the last. The core of the pyramid was usually built using local limestone. It's not the good quality stuff yet, because no one is going to see this core for a few thousand years, at which point everyone associated with this thing is dead and gone, and, gone, and so there'll be no embarrassment. The outer layer of stone, or casing stone, is the good quality limestone, which will give your pyramids the lovely white sheen that will really make it stand out against the landscape. The casing stone needed to be cut to ensure that a nice, smooth, inclined surface was there. <laughs> I'm doing this with a kitchen right now. Like, we're having a, a kitchen. We're, we're renovating a house. It's been going on forever. And they're finally putting in the kitchen. And our builder was like, you should go to Ikea. And it's like, well, I don't really want to do my kitchen in Ikea because I'm a snob. <laughs> No, it was just we wanted something, you know, because in my mind, Ikea's just a bit... I know, it, Ikea's great, don't get me wrong, but I don't imagine it's going to last as long as, like, a carpentered kitchen. And the builder was like, nah, mate, you, yeah, at least the insides. Just go to Ikea, they'll design everything, and then have the insides at least made by Ikea. If you want, like, fancier doors put on, we could do that, but just get Ikea to make all the insides. They're the, fa they're the bits that no one sees. <laughs> and it doesn't matter, and Ikea do an amazing job, so I'm like, okay, save me a fortune. 
The casing stone needed to be cut to ensure that nice, that nice smooth inclined surface. To do this, the workers used copper chisels and, and saws that had to be sharpened regularly as copper is a pretty soft metal. Some of the stones actually show markings where work had to stop for a chisel to be sharpened before work on said stone could continue. Finally, the capstone of your pyramid is going to be a really hard stone, usually granite or basalt. The capstone was then plated with gold, silver, or an alloy of gold and silver to really make it pop. And so we have the plan, we have the foundation, and now we need stone. Lots and lots of stone. And uh, 2.3 million! Quarrying the stone. A lot of your more alternative historians claim that ancient Egyptians couldn't have built the pyramids because they had no way of cutting the stone. However, it's amazing what you can do when you have a workforce of 20,000 people. Yeah, imagine all the YouTube videos I could make. What the Egyptians may have lacked in technology, they simply made up for with sheer numbers. Stone was quarried using copper chisels and saws, along with an abrasive like quartz sand to cut soft stone like sandstone and limestone for harder stone. The for harder stone like granite, diorite, and basalt, something a little stronger was needed. So the workers turned to another stone, dolerite, to make dolerite pounders, basically a round ball of the hard black rock. Most of the stone used in the building of the pyramids at Giza are uh, quarried on the Giza Plateau. The stone used for Khufu's pyramid was quarried from a horseshoe-shaped quarry just south of the pyramid, while the blocks for Menkore's pyramid probably came from a quarry located south-southeast of the pyramid itself. Higher quality limestone for the casings probably came from the quarry at Tura, about 10 miles south of Cairo on the Nile River. In order to cut the limestone blocks, workers would first chisel out a slot along three sides of the block. Once the work was done, they would drill holes along the bottom edge of the block and insert levers into the holes to break the stone loose from the quarry wall. All of this is amazing and everything, and it's always like, this is so cool, like these giant things they're building. But do you think all of these guys are like, oh, for God's sake, it's just a fancy tomb. No one's even going to use it. <laughs> I wish we were building something like a school or a hospital. Instead of just this fancy building for a dude who's gonna die and thinks he's a god. I mean, he is a god! <laughs> the pegs would be filled with water and expand, splitting the stone. God, that's clever. Smart. Once the stone was broken free, the block of granite would be slid down into a waiting boat. No fancy machinery needed, just human creativity. The expanding the, the, the wood to split the stone is just so big brain. I, I couldn't think of that today. Even if... If, if I didn't know about that now, and someone was like, well, how do I just split this stone? I just wouldn't be able to figure it out. I'd be like, oh, we've got to wait for winter, and we'll pour some water in there, and the water will freeze. And it's be like, no, you just put some put some wood in there. Get, I just wouldn't think it would be strong enough. Wow, this is so cool. Now we have the stone, we're faced with another problem. Moving the incredibly heavy blocks of stone from point A to point B. Transporting the stone. The pyramids were built well before the ancient Egyptians started using the wheel, so how they moved the stones from the quarry to the actual building site is one of the many mysteries of the pyramids. However, we have a few theories. Two of these theories involve water. According to one theory, the blocks were levered onto wooden sleds and then hauled along by teams of workers. However, if you've ever tried dragging anything over sand, you'll know that dry sand will pile up in front of the thing that you're dragging. In the case of the pyramid builders, a sled until it becomes almost impossible to move. If you've got enough people, I'll just have like five dudes just at the front of the block, just constantly digging it out. Just be like moving that sand, da 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 da. And then you'd have like a thousand dudes just like pulling on strings. And it's just a lot of dudes. You'd just be like, Let's go. There's, there's so many people can really solve a whole lot of problems. How the scientists have found that wet sand would reduce the friction and eliminate the sand piles, making it much easier for a team of people or animals to move something like a heavy block of stone. The water to sand ratio is important, though. Too much water and you'll end up with mud, which will just bog down whatever you're trying to move, while the correct ratio will create capillary bridges connecting grains of sand to each other and making it easy to slide something heavy over the wet sand. That's amazing. <laughs> it's it's amazing that they came up with this artwork in tombs also supports this theory the tomb of good lord unpronounceable pharaoh Digja Huitotep, <laughs> which dates to around 1900 bce contains a descript depiction of a team of around 170 men dragging a statue around 20 feet high with one person walking in front of it and moistening the sand originally egyptologists thought that this had some religious significance but perhaps the purpose of this was scientific rather than religious this 
This would be fine for blocks quarried on the Giza Plateau, but what about the blocks coming all the way from Tura and Aswan? To move uh, Aswan. To move these blocks, our ingenious Egyptians harness the power of the Nile. Today, the Nile River doesn't come anywhere near the Giza Plateau. It's miles away. However, this might not have always been the case. Using fossilized pollen particles, a multinational team of researchers have proven that a now lost branch of the Nile River once linked to the Nile to the Giza Plateau, meaning that the blocks coming from afar could be shipped to the pyramids instead of being dragged overland. Some theorize that the Egyptians built a complex of canals that led right up to the base of the Giza Plateau, making the transportation even more efficient. Excavations have also uncovered what could be a port at Giza near the workers town built for Menkore's pyramid, which would have been used to bring in not only the blocks, but also the supplies for the workers. Much like our first water theory, there is some historical record to back it up. In 2013, archaeologist Pierre Tallet made an astonishing discovery. While excavating caves determined to be some sort of boat storage depot used around 4,600 years ago, a few miles inland from the Red Sea in Wadi al Jaf, he came across rolls of papyrus, some a few feet long and relatively intact, written in hieroglyphics, as well as hieratic, hir a cursive writing system used in ancient Egypt. As it turned out, he had discovered some of the oldest known papri pap papyri. Pap papyri? Pap papyri? Look, papyruses. <laughs> Among the Paprii was the journal of an official named Mera, who led a crew of around 200 men who traveled from one end of Egypt to the other, picking up and delivering goods like some sort of ancient UPS. One of these trips included stopping at Tura, a town along the Nile known for its limestone quarry, picking up some limestone and shipping it up the Nile River to the Giza Plateau. A journey of around 10 miles, both Mark Lenner, the man who found the workers' village in Talat, feel that the harbour at Wadi al Jaf was an important harbour for the pyramid project. Other than the stone from Tura, the Egyptians needed vast amounts of copper for their tools. The main source of copper was the mines in the Sinai Desert, just opposite Wadi al Jaf. Of course, there were also a few food sources in the Sinai and surrounds. So, that we, so it would have been up to the teens, like Mariner's men, to not only get the copper and quarry box to Giza, but also to get food from the rich agricultural lands along the Nile to the men working at the mines in Sinai, extracting the copper. Early Egyptians loved their bureaucracy and team leaders. Who doesn't? Who doesn't love bureaucracy? <laughs> I'm in, the, I'm in the process of getting um, like a document renewed with the government, and they're like, okay, great, make an appointment and come in. And I'm like, okay, so I'll bring this with me. And they're like, no, 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 no. This is the appointment for making the appointments. And I'm like, oh, for fuck, why? 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 Huh? Why not? Why would you have it like this? <laughs> it makes no sense. It is just bureaucracy. And I love it. <laughs> Like Mera, who would have uh, team leaders like Mera, who would have travelled with most, if not all, of their written records, because they had to account for their time. Apparently, we can blame the ancient Egyptians for the concept of timesheets. Oh, is this like, is a timesheet? I think I had like I worked in a shop and they'd have this machine where you go in and then there's this big wall and they have these little cards and then you like take the card and you drop it in a machine. It's like gong, and then you take it out and you put it on the on the wall and it has like a list of when you came in and when you go out so they can pay you correctly. <laughs> and I remember always being like, I'm gonna finish my shift and then I'm gonna use the toilet. You know, for a proper amount of time. Like empty my, you know. You, you guys don't need details. And then I definitely always stamped it out afterwards because I loved getting paid to have a poo. It's possible that the records were buried at Wadi al Jaf simply because it was the last trip the team made. Regardless, the journal definitely supports the theory that the Nile River was used to transport blocks and that the ancient Egyptians built canals redirecting the Nile to go where they wanted it to go. An older theory that I remember from my childhood is still considered a plausible means of transportation, but it has lost some ground to the whole river theory. This theory states that the stone blocks were put on a sledge. Wooden logs called rollers were then placed underneath the sledge, using a path paved with gypsum or hardened clay to prevent the blocks from sinking into the loose desert sands, the sledge would be dragged to the construction site. One group of workers would pull the block with ropes, while another would move the rollers from the back of the sledge to the front to keep the whole business moving forward. Yeah, I remember being taught this, or like learning this when I was a kid. I think that's what people just were like, yeah, that's how, that's how they did it. And they're like, no, they did some genius thing with capillaries. I'm like, holy <laughs> That's cool. I like that this, this was all happening like thousands of years ago. And it's like, just today people are like, they're updating it and the books get changed. It's like, history's cool.
While this is a good theory, there is a problem. Egypt was not exactly covered in forests, so wood was not an abundant, infinite resource. It was relatively scarce in ancient Egypt, and much of it was imported. Unlike the first two theories, there also hasn't been any proof in the archaeological record to back this up. However, future research will prove once and for all how exactly the blocks were moved from quarry to construction site, but for now the blocks have finally arrived at the pyramid. Now you need to start stacking them. However, how exactly this was done might be the biggest mystery of all. Placing the stone. Yes, yeah, so far it's like we're doing a show called Decoding the Unknown. It's like so far there's no mysteries. It's like they did this, and then they did this, and then they did that. Thanks for the history lesson, Simon. Get to the mystery fact, boy! In 450 BCE, Greek historian Herodotus visited the pyramids and speculated that machines were used to build these awe-inspiring monuments. Today, scholars assume that the machines he was referring to were probably cranes. Back in ancient times, Egyptian farmers used a shadow, a wooden crane-like device to raise water from the Nile to irrigate their land, so this contraption would have been available to the pyramid builders. According to this theory, hundreds of these crane-like contraptions were used to lift the blocks from one level to the next. This is a promising theory, but once again, we run into the wood problem. Wood wasn't that plentiful in ancient Egypt. Timber strong enough for shipbuilding, which is a round, which is round about the strength that you'd probably need for a crane that's going to lift blocks weighing 2.5 tons, was imported from Lebanon at great cost. Whether that's something that an almighty and powerful pharaoh would have even taken note of is unclear, but I'm sure the poor guy trying to balance the books might have had something to say about it. However, a bigger problem to the theory is the question of where you would put these cranes. The higher you went, the less space you would have. Closer to the top of the pyramid, you would have a as little as 18 inches of standing room, which certainly wasn't big enough for a crane large enough to carry a heavy block of stone. Yeah, but as you go up, aren't the blocks also reducing in size? Wasn't Isn't that the whole reason everything's getting smaller? So wouldn't the cranes get smaller as well? 300 years later, Diodorus of Sicily had a different idea. He suggested that ramps were used to build the pyramids. That's what I remember being taught, that they'd push them up on like ramps and slot them into place. He suggested that the ramps were used to build the pyramids, and the ramp theory is still a pretty solid contender today. Good. Not everything I was taught at school turned out to be a lie. Those bloody rollers from Lebanon. In order to get the blocks into position on the higher tiers of the pyramids, the workers probably used ramps to haul the blocks to where they needed to go. The ramps were most likely built along with the pyramids. For each tier added to the pyramid, another layer would be added to the ramps. The ramps were then dismantled once the pyramid was completed, which is why no archaeological trace of ramps around the pyramids has ever been found. However, the question arises, what was the configuration of the these ramps. Were they straight on, perpendicular to the pyramid, zigzagging along one of the sides of the pyramid, or spiraling around the pyramid? Your ramp couldn't be too steep. Researchers are of the opinion that an 8% slope would have been the maximum. Anything steeper, whoa, that's going to be a really, really long slope. In my imagination, or like memory, which is probably an accurate memory, is that they were just pushing them directly up the edge of the pyramid, like just straight up that steep thing which is not an eight degree incline <laughs> by any stretch of the imagination. And in my mind, there's like two dudes pushing them up. <laughs> it's like, obviously not. They weigh tons. <laughs> Literally. Anything steeper and it would have been impossible for the workers to haul the stone blocks up the ramp. However, with such a gentle slope, by the time you reach the top of the pyramid, the ramp is going to be almost a mile long if it's just a straight-on ramp. This would have been a sizable construction. No shit, a mile-long ramp that's strong enough to support a ton of uh, brick. Several tons of brick. That's crazy. Uh, the spiral ramp would solve this problem, but creates a few new problems. If a ramp were running around the pyramid, the body of the pyramid would essentially be buried under a ramp. This would make it impossible for the surveyors to take frequent measurements of the angles at the corners that would be necessary to make all your corners meet at the right place at the top. So, not an ideal configuration for ramps either. Eventually, however, someone asked a very interesting question. What if the ramp was on the inside? In 2003, Jean-Pierre Houdon, a French architect, proposed the internal ramp theory after spending years making detailed computer models of the Great Pyramid at Giza. According to Houdon, the internal ramp used to build the pyramid still exists inside the pyramid today. Well, just go look inside then! We'll solve this mystery! Obviously, there's a reason they didn't just go inside and be like, oh, there it is. <laughs> Done! According to Houdon's theory, the lower third of the pyramid was built using a straight external ramp to haul the blocks into position. This ramp was made using limestone blocks, similar to those being used in the construction of the pyramid, only smaller. While the bottom part of the pyramid was being built by one group of workers, a second group was building a second ramp inside the pyramid. Houdon reckons that this second ramp begins at the bottom of the second pyramid and is around 6 feet wide, running at a grade of around 7%. Once the lower half of the pyramid was finished, our intrepid builders switched to the internal ramp to move the blocks to their place. 
space for the remaining two thirds of the pyramid. Okay, fair enough. The huge granite and limestone blocks used for the roof beams and the rafters of the queen's and king's chambers inside the pyramid weighed up to 60 tons and would have been too big to fit through the internal ramp. This meant that the outer ramp probably remained in place until these were put in position, at which point the outer ramp was dismantled and the smaller blocks of limestone used for the ramp were hauled up via the internal ramp and used for the top two thirds of the pyramid. This sounds pretty good. Like, it's a nice theory. Everything slots into place. Is there any archaeological evidence for it? though. Some theorize that the blocks in the upper part of the pyramid are smaller because they had to fit up a smaller internal ramp. I'm no builder, but this does make sense to me. Yes, this theory makes a ton of sense. It seems very clever. But show me the evidence. What fucking evidence do you have? However, designing this internal ramp would have been tricky. It would needed to circumvent any internal chambers and passages, and you would also need to figure out how to turn a corner while hauling heavy stone blocks up a narrow ramp. Houdon suggested that the internal ramp had openings where a simple crane could be used to turn the blocks. This theory was given a little extra credit by a fox. Okay, in 1986, a member of a French team surveying the pyramid spotted a desert fox enter through a hole next to what appeared to be an opening around two-thirds up the northeast corner of the pyramid. This hole could have been used to turn heavy block, and was right where Houdon much later predicted it would be. Now, unless it was one dedicated fox, it probably didn't climb up two-thirds of the pyramid. Rather, it might have found an entrance through a crevice close to the bottom of the pyramid and then used the internal ramp like any well-bred fox would. The French team also used microgravimetry to survey the pyramid. This is a technique where small differences in the strength of a gravitational field are measured, and it allowed the team to measure the density of different sections of pyramid to find any hidden chambers and passages. Holy sh**, no idea that's how it works. I just assumed they were using like x-rays or sonar or something. They're using something called microgravimetry. That's amazing. <laughs> That's amazing. I'm learning stuff in today's episode. That I feel like I've talked about the Egyptians so many times to the point of, you know, almost being, oh god, more Egypt. I'm learning some amazing shit today. Thank you, Ilza. They couldn't find any large hidden chambers, but their computer analysis did provide one image that they couldn't interpret at the time. However, if you consider the internal ramp theory, the image could very well show a ramp spiraling up through the pyramid. An internal ramp would certainly explain why no ramps or the remains of ramps have ever been found. A more controversial theory in archaeological circles suggests that the pyramids weren't built by stacking blocks on top of each other. Rather, they were cast from an early form of concrete made with limestone, clay, lime, and water. I told you, this is a real theory! More controversial, though. The claim was made in the 1970s by chemist and director of the Geopolymer Institute in Saint Quentin in France, Joseph Davidovitz, Professor Gilles Hug, Giles, Giles. I know I've got a mate called Giles, and he spells it with one L, so that feels more like Gilles, 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 Gilet, whatever. Hug and Professor Michel Barsoon, a respected researcher in the field of ceramics, further investigated this theory. After extensive testing using an electron microscope, the team discovered small structures within the inner and outer casing stone that's consistent with reconstituted limestone. The stones also had a high water content, which is unusual for the dry natural limestone found on the Giza, Giza Plateau. In order to make this concrete, quarried limestone from the Giza Plateau was dissolved in large pools of water fed from the Nile River until it reached a thin, watery consistency. Lime found in cooking fire ash and natron, a mineral salt used in the mummification process, were mixed in. The pools were left to dry until a mixture resembling moist clay was left behind. Presumably using big buckets, the clay would be carried up the pyramid to where the block needed to be and cast into reusable wooden molds. The wet concrete would then be left for a few days and undergo a chemical reaction similar to curing concrete. Well, wouldn't an easy way to figure this out be like well go chip a big go get a big block that no one wants anymore like maybe from the inside take it to a big lab and then cut it open and if there's like weird hairs in there if there's biological matter in there like someone's eyelash or something they'll be like well how did that get in there surely isn't isn't that gonna isn't that gonna figure it out According to this theory, the concrete method was only used for stones on the higher levels of the pyramid. The pyramids being cast versus the pyramids being cut and built would explain why, according to some, the stones at the bottom of the pyramids have a higher mass than the stones near the top of the pyramid. Barsoom also claims that some of the blocks fit together so closely that not even a human hair can be inserted between them, and considering the tools at the time, it's far more likely that the stones were cast tightly together rather than moved into position up ramps. It would also be easier to carry buckets of cement up a pyramid than it would be dragging a two-ton block of stone. 
However, there are some problems with the cast rather than cut theory. The obvious being wood. A huge amount of limestone chalk and burnt wood would need to be would be needed in order to make the concrete. And as we mentioned before, wood was in short supply in Egypt. Manpower, however, was not. There's also the fact that there's no mention of the wooden molds in the archaeological record. The wood most certainly would have been used for fuel or other construction projects, but the concept of using molds to cast the blocks for the pyramids has not been found anywhere in ancient writings. On top of that, concrete left to cure outside is going to trap whatever the breeze blows its way, so you'd expect to find all traces of things that you wouldn't normally find in limestone. Yes, of course, if you just look at the pyramids, you can see they look like thousands of individual blocks stacked on top of each other. They don't look like concrete blocks poured against concrete blocks where one side would be shared. Yeah, that's it. Like, I guess they could jumble around over time, but... I don't know, it doesn't seem super likely, does it? It's a cool theory, but I, 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 I'm like, there's, they had some ramps or something, surely. Like, the internal ramp theory is my favorite so far. Especially since they did that, like, looking inside thing and found the, the spiral. That's my favorite theory, to be honest. Another problem with this argument is that Davidovitz claims that the Egyptians poured their pyramids because moving pre-cut quarried stone would be too much work. Have a drag in the stone to pulls to crush, mix, and make the concrete means that you're still quarrying and moving the same mass of stone, just in smaller chunks. Yeah, but moving anything in smaller chunks is way easier. Also, you would need a lot of water, which would actually make the amount of material you're moving up the pyramid even more, not less. Now, on top of quarrying and hauling the stone to the site, the workers had to crush the stone, mix the cement, and then carry it by the bucket up the pyramid to cast, hoping that it doesn't dry out too much before reaching the spot where it should be poured. All in all, this sounds like a lot more effort not less. While there are some that firmly believe the cast versus cut build theory, my research suggests that most archaeologists and Egyptologists archaeologists and Egyptologists have their doubts. Of course, it's plausible that the builders used a combination of methods. It would be probably easier to cast the last stone layers simply because they wouldn't be that simply because there wouldn't be that much room to maneuver cut blocks of stone without losing a couple of workers over the side, and it's a long way down. As for the ramp, I think I side with a fox on this one. The internal ramp theory is still being researched, but recent updates are promising, so perhaps we've solved at least one of the mysteries of the Pyramids of Giza. Honestly, it sounds like we've solved a lot of the mysteries, doesn't it? Like Most of that stuff is like, how did they do this? And then archaeologists figure it out because that's what they do. Conclusion The pyramids have withstood natural and man-made disasters for thousands of years. The Great Pyramid of Giza is the last of the seven wonders of the world still standing. They are an impressive reminder never to underestimate the dedication and ingenuity of our ancient ancestors. If you really want to do something and put your mind to it, you find a way. However, more than just a monument to our ancestors, the inscriptions, decorations, and artifacts found within the pyramids and their accompanying burial complexes around Egypt have given modern researchers a good understanding of Egyptian society and religion. However, despite all we've discovered about them, the pyramids are still jealously guarding their biggest secret. Maybe one day we'll discover that Pyramids for Dummies Pyramid, the one with the step-by-step -step instructions and pictures and everything, but until it's found, the mystery of how exactly the pyramids were built, sadly, will remain a mystery. Honestly, it doesn't sound like it's going to be a mystery for very much longer. I think you're gonna, we're going to crack this one fairly shortly. Or at least get it so it's so likely. Anyway, that's where we end today's episode. Thank you so much for being here. I appreciate it. If you enjoy the show, please do leave a review. If you're watching on YouTube, like, subscribe, and I'll see you next time.